What is up guys? We're going to be taking a look at this lab, clobbering DOM attributes to bypass HTML filters. This is an expert level lab. Having said that, we have covered most of the important prerequisites when solving the previous lab. So if you are not sure what DOM clobbering is, check out the walkthrough for the previous lab, exploiting DOM clobbering to enable cross-site scripting. One of the things we know about DOM clobbering is it takes advantage of non-standard browser behavior that's not covered by any specific web standard. Therefore, results can vary from browser to browser. Portswigger tells us that we need to be using Chrome in order to solve this lab. We find that Firefox handles ID attributes on web elements differently to Chrome. So it's not possible to clobber the DOM using Firefox in this example. Assuming we already have the prerequisite knowledge, this lab is not too difficult to understand. So without further ado, let's fire up the lab. So this lab is a blog. Let's fire up a post. And on each blog post, we have the ability to leave comments. Unlike the previous lab where HTML was allowed, the ability to use HTML in a comment here is heavily limited and it's protected by a JavaScript library known as HTML Janitor. So if we were to try and inject some typical HTML, could be something like image source equals X on error equals alert, we're going to find that the entire HTML element simply gets stripped. There are two JavaScript files on the back end. There is hmljanitor.js. That's the library itself that contains the sanitization functions. Then there is load comments with HTML janitor. This is the JavaScript that loads the comments and in the process of loading the comments, calls various sanitization functions on the comment to make sure there is no disallowed HTML. Now there is quite a lot of JavaScript here, so we're absolutely not going to go through everything. Let's just point out some key ideas. The first is this function HTML janitor receives a configuration object. This janitor doesn't necessarily do the same thing every time. The user can provide a configuration object that whitelists certain HTML elements and certain attributes on those elements. If we take a look at the load comments with HTML janitor.js file, we can see the configuration object being defined. We have let janitor equals new HTML janitor. Then we see inside the parentheses, a configuration object being passed to HTML janitor. This is the list of white listed elements. For example, we are allowed to make use of an input HTML element and we are allowed to define the following three attributes on that element, name, type, and value. We're also allowed to make use of a form element, and we are allowed to set the ID attribute on that form element. You can see, we can also make use of italics, bold, and the paragraph tag. Returning back to the HTML janitor.js file, it's helpful to be familiar with some basic DOM manipulation methods in JavaScript. For example, the dot attributes property is going to return the attributes on that DOM node. We can also see that as part of the process of sanitizing attributes, you can see we're making use of the JavaScript method remove attribute to strip disallowed attributes from a certain HTML element. And just looking a bit closer at the code, we can see there is a looping element in place here. So we actually have a for loop in JavaScript. And the idea is every time we reach the end of the loop, then we're going to increase the value of A by one. And for each loop, we're going to check out node.attributes at index A. The key takeaway here is that there is clearly heavy use of the dot attributes property on the DOM node. And if there was hypothetically a way to clobber this specific property, the end result would be that those attributes wouldn't be stripped from the DOM and it would allow us to potentially include some malicious attributes. Now I'm hoping with the prerequisite information on clobbering from the previous lab, you'll already begin to see why this specific payload provided in the walkthrough is going to work. So initially we inject a form element. This is actually one of the allowed elements and one of the cross-site scripting attack patterns that you might be familiar with is that we can set an ID element on the form. We can then make use of tab index attribute. Then we can choose on focus equals print. The basic idea here is that when we navigate to a specific URL, but we append hashtag X, it's going to focus on the element that has that ID, but the on focus event is going to call the JavaScript print method. In other words, we're setting up cross-site scripting attack here. 
Having said that, this form element on its own is not actually going to work. Why not? Because tab index and on focus are not whitelisted attributes according to the configuration options past the HTML janitor. So ordinarily, these are going to be sanitized from the output. The end result here is simply going to be form ID equals X because forms are allowed and the ID attribute specifically on forms is also allowed. And we've already seen in the JavaScript, if we refer to this specific HTML element as node, then we see that the JavaScript is looping through node.attributes, which is going to return the ID tab index and on focus attributes. But what if we're able to clobber the node.attributes value? And that's exactly what input ID equals attributes does. Now in the previous lab, the clobbering occurred when both elements had the same ID. It's fairly clear that these two elements don't have the same ID. So let's take a look at this in a simplified lab. So we have a very simple HTML page with the title DOM clobbering. We have a form, the ID equals my form. That means that we can access my form depending on the browser behavior through the window.myform property. We then have inside that form, the input with the ID of test. So here we are in Chrome in the console, window.myform is going to return the form element itself. If we take a look at window.myform.test, we can see the input ID inside the form. And if we access window.myform.attributes, we see the attributes, and remember it's this dot attributes property that HTML janitor is looping over and removing any attributes that are not explicitly whitelisted. So in summary, we can see that we can access my form through window.myform and we can access the input element through window.myform.test, which is the name of the ID property. Let's change that to attributes. Now we know previously window.myform.attributes was returning the attributes, but by setting the ID value on the input to attributes, we're actually clobbering the list of attributes and replacing them with the actual input element itself. So after refreshing the page, now when we access window.myform.attributes, you can see we're actually getting the input element returned rather than the actual attributes on the form. We've clobbered the myform.attributes property. That means when HTML janitor tries to access the attributes on my form, it's actually just being given the input HTML element. So it's not going to be able to effectively remove the attributes from the form itself. Now, in order to submit our blog post here, we need to fill out some arbitrary information. So let's do that right now. Let's post the comment. Let's go back to blog. And we can see as part of our comment, an input field. Let's inspect the DOM over that input field. We can see that we have a form with the ID of X. Now that was already a whitelisted attribute, but we can see that tab index and on focus, which were blacklisted or implicitly blacklisted attributes have now made it through and are now part of the page. So now heading to the exploit server, the idea here is that the victim is arriving at an attacker controlled domain and in an iframe on that domain, we load up the vulnerable post. So we have iframe source equals, and in port swigger, we need to replace this with our current lab ID. We're going to visit post query string post ID equals two. That was the post ID where we injected the vulnerable comment. Then we have an onload attribute on the iframe. Now this is our domain, so we have full control over this. We have a JavaScript set timeout. The idea with set timeout is it receives a callback function to execute after a specified period of time in milliseconds. So after 500 milliseconds has passed from the iframe load, we're then going to set this source equals this source plus hashtag X. Because we have set the tab index property on the form, it now means that we can focus on that element has an on focus attribute, it's going to execute the cross site scripting attack. Now, why do we need all of this set timeout? Why can't we just set on load this source equals this source plus hashtag X? In some cases it might work, but there's a little bit of a race condition here. You see when the page receives the HTTP response from the server, it gets access to the raw HTML. It then starts using that raw HTML to generate a document object model. But that process is not instant. It could take a period of time. So by introducing a delay here, we ensure that the DOM has been built. There is enough time for the dot attribute property to be clobbered. 
The actual loading of the comments itself is going to take some period of time as well, because remember that's done programmatically using JavaScript. It's not part of the raw HTML response from the server. It's explained here in the lab walkthrough. When the iframe is loaded after 500 millisecond delay, it adds the hashtag X fragment to the end of the page URL. The delay is necessary to make sure that the comment containing the injection is loaded before the JavaScript is executed. And by the JavaScript there, it's referring to the JavaScript in the iframe. So there's no point setting this source equals this source plus hashtag X if the comment hasn't even been loaded because the element with the idea of X won't even exist at that stage, it won't be part of the DOM. So back at the exploit server, we can choose store. You can also choose the view exploit option just to see if the payload actually works. So we can see the iframe load up. We can then see the JavaScript print function is called. Let's head back to the exploit server. We can now choose the option deliver exploit to victim and we get the message, congratulations, you solved the lab. So this was a slightly different application of DOM clobbering to the previous Port Swigger DOM clobbering lab. The idea behind that lab was that we had two elements with the same ID. We were then able to reference the second element via a name attribute. So similar concepts, slightly different layout to the HTML. The elements don't have the same ID, but we can see in this case, the input element is inside the form element. And browsers have decided, remember this is not part of any web standard, browsers have decided it's helpful if we can reference this inner element making use of its ID attribute. But as we can see, this intended helpful functionality is what ultimately causes the potential clobbering in terms of DOM vulnerability. Well, partly that, but also partly the way that HTML janitor was used in this case. If we'd whitelisted a different set of attributes, maybe we don't have the same issue. By the way, one of the really mind bending aspects of this lab is that ID attribute on the input element is not actually allowed and it's stripped from the page ultimately. But by the time that attribute has been stripped, it's already too late. So my form .attributes gets clobbered, then the ID attribute on the input element gets stripped, but only after the DOM has been clobbered. All right, hope it was helpful. Thanks very much for checking out the content. Catch you guys in the next lab.